What we do here is go back, 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 back. back. Hi, and welcome to Mr. Toyama's AP World History. This is Chapter 31, Societies at Crossroads. First up, we have our overview. The dramatic economic expansion of Western Europe and the United States in the 19th century was not matched by the older empires of Asia. The Ottoman Empire, the Qing Dynasty, the Russian Empire, and the Tokugawa Shogunate had all been vibrant and dynamic cultures at one time, but by the 1800, had become isolated and backwards. By 1900, all four had been challenged and changed profoundly. Common dimensions of those changes include the following. Conservative, autocratic regimes. None of the regimes discussed here shared in the liberal ideals of the Enlightenment or the Revolutionary Era. Rulers were absolute. Individuals had few rights, and dissident was viewed as dangerous. Military unpreparedness. Since those regimes failed to modernize, they found themselves outgunned by Western powers. Often, this realization followed a humiliating defeat. The loss of Egypt for the Ottomans, the Opium War for China, the Crimean War for Russia, and then equal treaty forced on Japan by the United States. For most regimes, this realization led to the radical restructuring of the military. Weak economies. All four regimes lacked the basic elements for industrialization, capital, free workers, and infrastructure. China and Japan had all been closed economies and had little contact with the outside world. The Ottoman and Russian empires had been agricultural societies with large, unskilled peasant populations. Imperial pressures. All four had to fight off imperialistic encroachments of the industrializing powers. The Qing dynasty was the least successful, and by the end of the century, had lost control of its economy and much of its territorial sovereignty. Japan was the most successful in competing economically and militarily with the West. Reform from the top down. Change, when it came, was entirely at the discretion of the rulers. Japanese reformers, for example, perceived that a written constitution would give credibility to their new state so that the emperor gave a constitution to the people that retained all power for the emperor. The Russian Tsar granted, and then rescinded, an elected legislature after the revolution of 1905. Alright, so here are some ideas that I kind of wanted to talk about. There is uh, kind of these chapters in our book that are seen as kind of uh, like weird kind of transitional chapters, and as you spend some time reading through them, you're going to realize that they're not really focused entirely on a section of the world, but kind of on the transitions of a region of the world. So today we're going to be focusing on mostly Eurasia, specifically four empires that we're going to be looking at as they really struggle with some of the, what we would call the interactions with the West. If you've been um, able to watch John Green's um, The Historical Methodology and the West as an idea, you'll kind of get the idea that the West is a set of ideas philosophies and kind of common understandings of the Enlightenment mixed with some Judeo-Christian values mixed in with some old uh, Greco-Roman philosophy. Now as the world increasingly became more uh, connected and, and uh, smaller through the use of communications and transmission of ideas, these interactions with the West and older empires started to come to a head, especially in this chapter, as uh, some of the older empires were having issues of figuring out what to do with these new ideas. There was cultural and economic hegemony. It's a, it's a word we've talked about in the past before, but I really do want to focus in on um, what it means really for us going forward and how we can uh, really look at it so that uh, we can understand our chapter a little bit better. Also, we're dealing with the long-term effects of the Enlightenment. We have just finished up in these last couple chapters a little bit about the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the ideals of the salons coming out of uh, uh, Paris, and what you really start to get is the rest of the world really being introduced to these new ideas. Industrialization has taken place in a lot of the world, and as a result of industrialization, uh, European empires at this time, traditional, uh, what we call the continental part of Europe, that is uh, really growing in power and prestige. The next chapter we're going to be looking at uh, the scramble for Africa and some of the uh, colonization uh, practices that these Euro continental Europeans were practicing in, but for this one we're going to be focusing on European interactions with pretty much uh, larger Eurasia, specifically Russia, uh, the Ottoman Empire, China, and Japan. Uh, so for our first section, we're going to be looking at the Ottoman reaction to modernization specifically and European influence in their empire. For the second section, Russian expansion and their Western-facing uh, ideals. We'll talk about that in a bit. And their poor execution of these Western-facing 
uh, beliefs. There was also a Chinese rejection of Western influence, which culminates in the self-strengthening movement, and the Japanese Meiji Restoration, uh, or solidification of imperial or centralized power back in the ideals of the emperor. But all four sections really focus on this question. What do we, for each of these four groups, do about the Europeans, their ideas that they're bringing with them, and their influence? Now, there's a famous... uh, kind of political science author, philosopher named Edward Said, and he wrote this book in the late uh, 1900s talking about uh, this concept of Orientalism, and he was arguing that Westerners oftentimes see the we- the East, or the Orient, f- as being this kind of otherworldly and savage and <clears throat> backwards kind of uh, place where the Europeans had to show up and really bring the Enlightenment ideas. And if you name your movement the Enlightenment or the beliefs of reason and rationalism, anyone who opposes them, by contrast, oftentimes comes uh, across as being uncivilized or unenlightened and unrational. Whereas many of these empires had had very progressive ideas, very forward thinking beliefs, and uh, Edward Said argued that these Western conceptions of the Orient really uh, fueled the belief that Europeans were superior, not just in their thought patterns, but in their genetics, and that this was a negative impact on the world at large that we're still feeling to this day. Now on here I have the two words that we're going to kind of focus on throughout a little bit more of our book. We have imperialism and nationalism. During this time, if if you ever played the game Risk, uh, there are sections of the globe broken up, and what you kind of do as a blue, red, green, orange, or yellow country, whatever, purple even, country, you start off in your section, and you get a certain size army, and you collect resources, and as you roll the dice and battle with other people, you collect more resources and build bigger armies, and eventually you try and dominate the board game, and you're able to take over larger and larger sections. Now, this is kind of a very basic version of imperialism, with the goal of the Europeans during this time to be able to go out and collect areas of the globe. These colonies were then supposed to provide raw materials for the Europeans' uh, new industrialization process. Not only did it provide the raw materials, what it also provided was new markets. So when we talked before about England and some of their uh, industrialization process as they made more textile specifically, what they started to realize is that Europe, through its uh, industrialization of its own, the markets or the amount of people able to buy the goods that were being produced in factories started to kind of dwindle. People don't need to buy that many clothes, and even if they did want to buy that many clothes, eventually they would run out of money. Imperialism was the belief that if we went around the world, and for example with England and India, the Europe, the British would go to India and have the Indians grow cotton, and they would then ship that cotton back to England where textile mills would spin it into cloth, And then they would be able to turn that into clothing, which would then be sent back to India and sold in that new market or area of the globe where people could purchase those goods. At the same time, you have a rise of a new idea called nationalism. We talked a little bit about the unification of Italy and Germany and how many of these people are uh, looking towards being more identified not with an empire or with specifically a religion or even a king or a lord, what they're really starting to identify is with a people group. Now, nationalism is a very complicated thing to explain, but for our purposes, we're really going to just look at how, during this time, Europeans started to see themselves as distinctly and wholly independent from other groups. Even though for our study of history, we know they interacted, they spent time together, many of them uh, ended up moving and marrying and interbreeding with one another. I don't know if that's the right word, interbreeding, but... There were French Englishmen who were part Irish and part Scottish, and all these different groups had pretty much been around forever, and you can trace it all the way back to the early Romans and some of the other people groups like the Gauls. But really what starts to happen is they identify themselves with the land in the region they uh, live in. They identify with the language that they commonly spoke. They identify with the religion that most people commonly identify with. And they identify with a common history, a common food, and a common culture. Through this nationalism, it unified people. So for example, If I was to say something like the French nation, many of you have pictures in your head of 
a guy who who looks French. He has a little beret on his head. He probably speaks very uh, fast and eloquent French. He probably has like maybe a baguette in his hand. He uh, is probably sitting outside of a cafe in Paris with Eiffel Tower in the background. That those images are part of their culture. It's part of who they are, and it's part of what they identify as being French. While these are very simplistic explanations of who and what make up a culture. It's a very specific point for our chapter because as people started to identify with those ideals and those symbols and that culture, that drove people to believe that not only did they need to spread their culture around the world because obviously believing theirs was the best, that they needed to go around the world and really enlighten through uh, the best of their culture the peoples of the world and bring them what those cultures had. And so this is going to come to a head in many of the countries we're going to look at. Now, in the bottom we have Antonio Gramsci. And Antonio Gramsci is a uh, communist philosopher, and really he's only on here because I really want to talk about the idea of hegemony. Now, hegemony is the political or economic or military predominance or control of one state over others. There's lots of words on here. I don't really want to look at it, but what I do want to focus on is uh, international relations theory. So this will make sense as we kind of go through our chapter. So hegemony denotes a situation of, number one, great material asymmetry in favor of one state who has, number two, enough military power to systematically defeat any potential contender in the system. So I'm going to pause there. Hegemony denotes the situation of great material asymmetry of in favor of one state. One group, let's say Britain, has lots of resources, specifically, in this instance, industrialized goods, let's say guns, okay? And through this asymmetry or imbalance of one state has enough military power to systematically defeat any potential contester in the system. The British are going to do this largely in the Ottoman Empire. And then number three, controls the access to raw materials, natural resources, capital or money and markets. Through this uh, imbalance of goods and through military power, this first government or state is able to control the access to the raw materials, natural resource capital, and markets of another state. Through this process, they're able to get competitive advantages, meaning that they're able to do better in that other country. So for the example I've been using, the British were able to be more successful in the Ottoman Empire because of their use of military power and controlling the access of raw materials, natural resources, capital, and markets which allowed them to be more successful in the area of the Ottoman Empire through the production of value-added goods. And what that means is when the British were able to harvest raw materials and turn them into uh, manufactured goods like textiles, those value-added goods were then able to increase the wealth of the receiving nation. In this example, Britain again. This generates an accepted ideology reflecting the status quo and is functionally differentiated from other states in the system, being expected to provide certain public goods as a security or commercial and financial stability. As a result of the British in this example uh, controlling the access to markets, the raw materials, it creates within the people that are being subjugated or oppressed uh, the belief that this is just the way it is, the status quo. and it basically is expected through this process to provide certain goods such as security or commercial or financial stability. So the British effectively take over the security of the Ottoman Empire in my example. They effectively help run the markets and make the laws and establish the markets that are in those regions based on their power and strength. Uh, and through this process, near the bottom, in cultural imperialism, the leader state dictates the internal politics and societal character of the subordinate states. Basically the larger countries with more resources are able to dictate or tell the smaller countries what they're going to do and how they're going to run their country, either through a internal sponsored government that they favor or by an external installed government put in place. And this will make a lot more sense as we go forward looking at uh, Scramble for Africa and our four, four sections going forward. So this chapter is kind of complicated, and the best way I thought was to kind of break up this chapter into a chart. You have the four sections that we're going to be talking about. And then you have issues in their country. So every one of these sections pretty much breaks up into there's something going on in each of these regions or countries. And as new challenges or instability or chaos is happening in those areas, then comes the Western Europeans. 
and their interactions and interference in internal politics, whether it be through government or through the markets, like selling goods. Once those Western Europeans show up and do certain things, there's always a reaction to Western interference and intervention. And this comes about as a result of internal governments or internal peoples of, for example, Russia, China, Japan. They react to what the Europeans are doing in their country. And then we're going to talk about the outcomes and long-term effects of the Europeans meddling in those uh, regions. So with that being said, we're going to start off with the Ottoman Empire here in orange. So first up, the Ottoman Empire in decline. The Ottoman Empire reaches the peak of military expansion in the late 17th century. So the Ottoman Empire, which we've been looking at for a while, has grown and grown and grown, and now it's near the end of the 17th century, and their military and expansion of their empire has pretty much ceased. Uh, they did, were defeated by Austrians, Russians, uh, largely due to European advances in technology and strategy. During this time, uh, there's a big shift towards repeating weapons, uh, cartridge guns. Uh, basically, the Europeans have better lots of stuff, and this uh, produces an imbalance of power in the Ottoman Empire in favor of the Western Europeans, specifically Austrians and even Eastern Europeans, the Russians. Now, if you remember back to our gunpowder empires we were talking about before, uh, the elite Janissary Corps, this old school military uh, established in the palace group designed to kind of protect the empire and to keep order, they start to get involved in palace intrigue. There's just lots of corruption, there's lots of uh, people doing things they shouldn't be doing and not always putting their empire first, but really getting rich, doing bribes, favors. There's lots of things going on that isn't making their culture more successful. At the same time, there are semi-independent local warlords who are using mercenaries and slave armies to support the sultan, and this is only in exchange for imperial favor. So this is a tenuous relationship where many people are pretty much going along to get along until something better comes along. And finally, there's massive corruption and misuse of tax revenue. So you can see the setup for our first box, where people are basically seeing the Ottoman Empire having lots and lots of problems. And all it takes is, as a, like a bunch of dominoes set up, is one thing to kind of push it over the edge. Well, eventually, there's some territorial losses. Russia takes territories in the Caucasus in Central Asia. And then there's some nationalist uprising that drive the Ottomans and the Ottoman Empire out of the Balkan area. Then we have Napoleon's unsuccessful attack on Egypt spurs the local revolt against Ottomans under Muhammad Ali. Nominally subordinate sultan, but threatened to capture Istanbul. Now, Muhammad Ali working uh, really uh, in favor of the Egyptians, he is really able to rally Egyptians around him and push out the Ottomans, uh, basically claiming the area of Egypt separate from uh, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, this this kind of results in a shrinking or a contraction of the Ottoman Empire, and he basically threatened to capture Istanbul, which is the you know capital of the Ottoman Empire. And the Brit British basically show up to support the Ottomans only to avoid possible Russian expansion. The belief by the British was that if the Russians saw the chaos that was happening in the Ottoman Empire, they would push through into the Ottoman Empire and take more land, making Russia larger, uh, eliminating kind of a, a wall between the rest of Western Europe and the Russians. If you look here on our map, we have the Ottoman Empire in purple in 1800, but by the time we get to around the uh, early 1900s, we have pretty much just the orange area. If you were somebody living in the Ottoman Empire, you would see an empire that was once vast and uh, really just a large part of uh, the world, especially in Central Asia, as falling apart. And the contraction part really is starting to cause people to look at it as like a wounded animal. Well now, at the same time, there's an Ottoman economy that has imports of cheap manufactured goods, placing stress on local artisans and urban riots results. If you remember back to our Industrial Revolution chapter, the Europeans were able to be manufacturing lots of goods very efficiently through the use of factories, the assembly line, basically modernizations through industrialization. If you were a local artisan, let's say you made clothing on an old style hand loom, you maximum could make, what, 20 shirts a day? Well, in a factory in London, they could be making thousands of shirts a day on giant looms, 
And as a result, your costs would not be able to go down, but the cost of goods being imported through this process would uh, be way cheaper than anything you could uh, produce. As a result, these local artisans start to lose out on money, and through stress of losing money, the urban riots result. And this is basically as a result of uh, those industrialization processes from England. There was an export-dependent Ottoman economy increasingly relying on foreign loans. As the Ottomans were de exporting goods, uh, they start to not have lots of really good trade negotiating uh, ability. They're able to not make as much money as they once were making. At the same time, Europeans were basically uh, finding new routes, making new trade uh, or passages, and really trying to find new ways to not really work with the Ottoman traders that they had in the past. So as the economy is basically going down, as no one's able to make any money, by 1882, the Ottomans are unable to pay even the interest on the loans and forced to accept foreign administration of debt. So at this point, really what happens is the banks that they had been borrowing loans from, uh, the foreign loans, basically come to them and say, look, Ottoman Empire, we're not going to give you any more money unless you basically allow uh, foreign banks to come in and say, we are going to dictate what your businesses are, what your government's going to be, and then we'll, we'll start to talk about you guys paying back your loan and the interest on the loans. This leads to capitulations, which are agreements that exempted Europeans from Ottoman law. So because the Ottoman Empire was in so much debt, the banks reached an agreement saying, hey, let's make some mm, new laws. And those new laws are basically going to make it so that our uh, countrymen, our British, for example, uh, countrymen, are going to be able to trade in your area without paying taxes and without... Uh, really having to follow any specific laws on labor or any kind of uh, really any regulations. Now this leads to an increase in profits for those foreign companies, but it, many of the uh, the local companies are going to lose out as a result of this. Extraterritorially gives tax-free status to foreign banks and businesses, and at the same time these foreign banks and businesses move in and they're pretty much able to make tons and tons of money as the Ottoman economy is falling apart. So as a result of this Western European meddling, which was our second box, we're now in our third box, there's an attempt at tax reform to increase agricultural output and to reduce the corruption. These are all good ideas, and they're all kind of modeled on just good government, but a lot of it comes from the idea of the Enlightenment. They want to fix how the taxes were uh, adjusted. Think about like the French Revolution, how basically that whole thing was about the nobility and the clergy not being... Uh, forced to pay any taxes or very little taxes. Increase in agricultural output. A lot of the Ottomans are seeing the um, agricultural revolution that had happened in most of Western Europe and trying to mo uh, model themselves after that uh, revolution. And the reduction of corruption, the belief in opening up positions in government towards uh, people who really were there based on merit rather than on lineage or nobility. And these are all Enlightenment ideals. Sultan Selim even remodels their army along European lines. Now, if you are an Ottoman, what you're seeing is that there's all this Western influence and there's all this Western change coming in from your empire that's very old at this point, which had been doing fine until the Europeans showed up. At the same time, you see many people losing their jobs. You see local artisans unable to feed their families. You see foreign banks getting private uh, and special treatment. And basically, you have a group of uh, Janissaries, who are the old school, almost nobility-like uh, group living in palaces, and they see this as a threat to their way of life. And those Janissaries revolt, they kill those new troops, they imprison the Sultan, and this is really a reaction. That's what it is, an example for our chart. It's a reaction to the Western influence. Sultan Mahmud II attempts the same and even has the Janissaries massacred, so he's going to eliminate uh, the Janissaries completely. Uh, through Sultan Mahmud, we have also reforms for schools, very Enlightenment idea, taxation reform again, build t building of telegraph and postal service, almost like a very progressive way of looking towards Europe and their technology. Well, then we have kind of a weird hmm, shift. We have what's called the Tanzimat or Reorganization Era. The pace of reform is accelerated. They draft new law codes, kind of to reflect a lot of these Enlightenment ideals. But at the same time, 
there is this move towards uh, secularization, but still uh, really a desire to work with the Europeans to try and keep their empire afloat. So the new people in charge really are just trying to keep things going the way they are. So there are three groups we're going to talk about right now. There's the Tanzimat, reorganizers. Then we have uh, these undermined power of traditional religious elites, right? If you are someone who's watching this going on and you're an older Muslim cleric, you've seen the Ottoman Empire, you trace yourselves back to some of the early clerics under Islam, you see your empire pretty much being taken over by foreigners, and you see people really moving towards secularization, and the ideals of the Enlightenment very much were about removing religion from the public space. Uh, you start to get a little worried. And as you start to get worried, you're going to face opposition from, uh, or you're going to bring about our opposition from with religious conservatives and the bureaucracy. You don't want to see things change because things had been working fine. It was the foreigners that showed up that caused all these problems in your eyes if you're a uh, religious elite. And also your way of life might be threatened. You've seen the path of history and you know what happened to those clergy in France and some of the other areas of Europe as they embraced those ideas in the Enlightenment. There's also opposition from another group of radical young Ottomans who call themselves the Young Turks. They also wanted a constitutional government. Oops, let me go back. They wanted a constitutional government. This is a strange dichotomy. These radicals almost see that the system is too corrupt to continue. So. What they want is a giant change to the system, and they want to see people really uh, embrace the ideals of the Enlightenment and shift towards a more constitutional government like they have in America, in France, and some of the other nationalized European areas. This Young Turk era is started off in 1876 with radical dissonant elements stage a coup, or an overthrow of the government, and they put in charge Abdul Hamid II as sultan. And they write a constitution, and they create a representative government, but all pretty much are destroyed within one year. Many of the people who participated in this process were exiled, some were executed or killed. And this principal organization was known as the Ottoman Society for Union and Progress, also known as the Young Turk Party, because they were pretty much organized around Turkish young people. It was founded by Ottomans living in exile hmm, in Paris, a place where they had just seen some of those ideas of the Enlightenment and had been talking more about secularization and rule of law and the ideas of Voltaire and Montesquieu and Rousseau and Hobbes and Locke and looking at the governments of America and looking at the governments of France that had been uh, transitioning towards a more uh, open and democratic system. Now. They called for rapid secular reforms. This is that liberal, conservative contrast we've talked about in the past. And they forced Abdul Hamid II to restore the parliament and then dethroned in favor of Mehmed V. Rashid, or Mehmed V. Rashid. Under the Young Turk rule, they attempted to establish Turkish hegemony over the far-flung empire. Now, what these Young Turks see is that these Europeans have been coming in and they have been influencing some of the areas of uh, Turkey and the Ottoman Empire that they really once held really strong grasp over and has fallen into chaos. And the young Turks believe all we have to do is practice just like the Europeans. And if we're able to act like the Europeans and basically go around and take what we think we want, use our military, re <clears throat> reach new laws, then maybe we can do kind of what the Europeans are doing. <clears throat> Turkish has made the official language as an idea of trying to unify nationalizing uh, factors within the country. And despite large numbers of Arabic and Slavic language speakers, this doesn't go over well. <clears throat> this could not contain the forces of decline. They eventually lose some wars as they go around and try and uh, interact with Europe in a number of ways. These subject people seek autonomy and independence, specifically those Arabic and Slavic speakers. And pretty much Europe keeps uh, the Ottoman Empire afloat in one way or another as a way of balancing power to not let Russia get too strong, but also not to let the Western Europeans take much more of the Russian uh, part of the globe. So that's our Ottoman Empire. Here's our chart again. We're going to now move on to Russia and talk a little bit about issues in their country, Western interactions, reactions to those interactions, and outcomes. So we have the Russian Empire under pressure. Russia is a massive multicultural empire and it's pretty much only about approximately half speak Russian or observe the Russian Orthodox Christianity. The Romanov Tsars rule an autocratic or basically top-down, unquestioned empire. Uh, 
There is a powerful class of nobles that are exempt from taxation and military duty, and there is very exploitative serfdom with a very large population of poor people. This sounds kind of familiar if you're uh, thinking back a couple chapters ago. Here is the Russian Empire. The green represents between 1801 and 1885, so that's what we're talking about right now. But then in, by 1855, we have the purple acquisitions, and then in, by 1914, we have blue acquisitions. But really, the idea I want to focus on is these two arrows near the bottom. Russia does this from time to time, and we're going to revisit this idea. But one thing that Russia has done throughout its history is it doesn't really know what it wants to do. Does it want to be a part of Asia, as it seems to be in larger parts of over China and in most of Central Asia? Or does it want to face towards Europe with Warsaw, Moscow, St. Petersburg pretty much being in European ports or near European ports? So we're going to talk about the Western and Eastern facing moods of Russia as we go through this chapter and future chapters going forward. The first thing we're going to talk about is a Western-facing move. In 1853 through 1856, the Russian expansion into the Caucasus in larger attempt to establish control over the weakening Ottoman Empire. The Europeans that have been going into the Ottoman Empire, and the Europeans, as in the next chapter we'll learn, have been going around the globe, the Russians want to join the party. They see their cousins, basically, running around the globe making colonies and taking over land and collecting raw materials, and they say they want a part of that too. The problem is, the Europeans don't want anyone else to come play the game, specifically the Russians. So with Ren Stepsen's the balance of power, the Europeans become involved. Russia is basically driven back from Crimea in a humiliating defeat. There is a demonstration of Russian weakness in the face of Rus Western technology and strategy. Russia was um, basically outgunned and outsmarted through this process. And even though this is a Western-facing uh, move, they see themselves as trying to play a game they're ill-prepared to play. The Europeans don't want the Russians to join the party. And as a result, the Crimean War is a devastating defeat of the Russians. Well, as a result of this, there's some reform. Uh, serfdom is the source of rural instability and peasant revolt. The peasants are getting frustrated. Some of them are being taught about the ideas of what's happening in France. Some of them are basically just upset that they're not able to provide enough for their families and food. And really when it comes down to it, it doesn't really matter if you're upset and angry, you want things to change. So Tsar Alexander II, he emancipates the serfs in 1861. Very key time. He basically says all the serfs who had been locked to the land are free. They no longer have to pay... Uh, taxes to the lords or the nobility uh, in their area. They basically can go and do what they please. The problem is he doesn't alleviate poverty or the hunger for land that these farmers who know have very little education, if any at all, uh, have lived their whole lives farming. Many of them are now forced to pay for lands through rent that they had farmed for generations as a result of uh, the serfdom system. If you look at this, this sounds a lot like the American South after the Civil War. What you had was a freedom of people who had worked generations on farms, basically brutally and forcibly, and through their freedom still have very little education, were not given any real leg up in terms of alleviating their economic struggle, and many of the uh, American former slaves after the Civil War basically stayed on the land they had been farming with now paying massive amounts of rent and taxes to the people who owned the land that they were farming before. So basically slavery with some extra steps. There are uh, limited attempts to reform administration, one of which is a small-scale representative government. Tsar Alexander allows for a network of elected district assemblies called Zemstros, I hope I said that right. Uh, they pretty much are elected by the serfs. So if you were a serf in an area, you might be elected by a hundred people from your village to be your, their representative at the uh, larger policy debates or uh, big governmental decisions. Uh, it, it works okay <laughs> for a while. We then have industrialization. Russia. Uh, starts to look around and notice some things uh, happening in Western Europe, one of which is industrialization. 
There's a man named Count Sergei Witt. He's the Minister of Finance from 1892 to 1903. He creates the Witt system. Now, the Witt system is basically a large-scale investment into uh, government and public goods, and one of his biggest ideas that still is around today is the massive railroad construction, which is known as the Trans-Siberian Railroad pretty much covers large portions of Russia, and this was done in an effort to move raw materials, as Russia is a huge plot of land with many raw materials, from basically the far part of the east of the empire over to the west. There are massive industrial discontent, peasants uprooted from rural lifestyle to work for low wages and long hours. We can compare this to England as generations of farmers basically are driven off their land because they're unable to feed themselves, they're still land poor, they see some uh, hope in maybe going and working in industry, building the railroads, maybe working in some small-scale factories. Problem is, they get low wages, long hours, it's very dangerous work just like it was in uh, our last chapter about England, and you start to see a lot of discontent. Well, eventually, uh, there's a group called the Intelligentsia, Basically, really smart pants guys that uh, go around and read lots of books. And for them, the biggest ideas coming out of uh, Europe are the ideas of the Enlightenment, some of which uh, involve some socialism, some anarchism. Uh, remember, these socialists were really into uh, giving the people more say and autonomy through the government basically being elected and representative as a, on behalf of the people. And anarchists at the same time are wandering around saying basically the government has no right to tell us to do anything. And the government really is only the government that they give them that you give yourself. And there should be as limited of government as possible with uh, basic rights and liberties established. And these people, as they go around, spread these radical ideas and change, uh, really are creating terror tactics. We're talking about shootings and bombings and throwing grenades and trying to assassinate people and even in successfully assassinating people. Uh, there was an attempt to connect with the mistrustful peasantry in the 1870s and they were pretty much denounced and sent into Siberian exile. The Tsarist authorities turned to censorship and secret police, very radical move on their part to try and stop this growth of radicalism. But uh, nationalist censor, uh, sentiment starts to show up in the Baltic provinces, Poland, Ukraine, Georgia, and Central Asia. People are starting to get that maybe we don't need to be part of Russia. This Russian empire thing isn't really working out for us if we're Polish or Ukrainian or Georgian or Central Asian or from the Baltics. We, we really need to just take care of ourselves. And if you look at it, us Ukrainians, for example, we all speak you know, the same language. We have a similar history. We, we have similar stories. We have a, a nation here going. And if we don't need those Russians, why do we have them here? Well, then there's some radicalization. By 1881, the Radical People's Will movement assassinates the Tsar, Alexander II. And this sad part was this was a reformer. He's killed by these radicals who really don't see him as pushing it far enough. I want to revisit this a little later. But uh, this prompts a widespread pogrom or uh, violent riots, and these are attacks on Jews. Uh, really, I know this comes out of left field, but uh, through this time, there was a very large sentiment of anti-Semitism. We'll again revisit this later. But basically, Jews had been blamed for everything since about the year 70 CE in most of Western Europe and pretty much wherever they went around the globe. These pogroms were really attacks because uh, many people saw the anarchist and socialist movement as being identified with Jews, while at the same time they weren't really a part of that. This increased repression on the radical groups. Tsar Nicholas II enters into war with Japan by 1904-1905. This humiliating defeat exposes government weakness. Now, if you look at it, in an effort to try and uh, bring the people together, Tsar Nicholas II launches into a war with Japan, and guess what they're doing? They're no longer looking, looking to Europe for uh, growth and expansion. They're looking towards the east. They're looking to be large players in Asia at this point. This uh, social discontent boils over in a revolution of 1905, and strikes force the government to make concessions. Many people are not willing to work, and as a result of not being able to work, uh, or not willing to work, the government has to give up a lot of power, and this is where we're gonna kinda pause on Russia until we revisit during, uh, a little bit after World War One or during World War One. Now we're gonna go over to China. 
the Chinese had some uh, pretty interesting interactions with the British. First up, we have Chinese restrictions on British trade. Since 1759, European commercial presence was limited to the port of Guangzhou. If you remember back, China pretty much saw themselves as not really needing anything from the rest of the world. China pretty much had a policy of not really needing much in their view. They had built the Grand Canal, they had sent uh, Zheng He around the world with his seven voyages, and pretty much the consensus for most people in China was that China was pretty fine without the rest of the world, and most of the world kept showing up anyways to get some stuff from China, and they thought that was a pretty good solution to interacting with the world. Foreign mer merchants were forced to deal basically with only licensed Chinese firms called Kohongs. The currency of trade was exclusively silver bullion uh, because the Chinese pretty much couldn't see themselves needing anything from the rest of the world. That all is until the British East India Company heavily becomes involved in opium trade. The British Empire at this point figures out that if they're able to get people to accept the drug opium, which is the base ingredient for heroin, uh, that many people in China will buy it and be able to trade things that the British want. Now, as a result, we have to kind of look at where this opium comes from. The opium was grown in India and sold in China for silver. This silver was used to buy other Chinese products, and this creates a global trade network where the British are able to be uh, more successful in collecting the raw materials it needs as it expands its empire. Now, the opium trade was illegal. China had already made it illegal, but there was poor enforcement uh, by the government through some forms of corruption and basically British uh, hegemony or influence over the area through military might, through trade, and it's really, really easy to sell drugs to people if they're addicted. Increasing trade and social ills are evident by the late 1830. People are very aware that the British are getting lots of money through this process, while at the same time, uh, People are getting really, really messed up through this drug. The Chinese move to enforce a ban and really try and ramp up the pressure, but British agents basically have a small-scale war over opium, known as the Opium War from 1839 to 1842. The British forces, remember the British Navy being one of the uh, best and most well-equipped and also the most efficient at this time because of industrialization, easily defeat the Chinese, who had basically not traded or really looked at the rest of the world for many years. Uh, through this process, China is forced into a series of disadvantaged, disadvantageous treaties. In uh, U.S. history, you're going to look a little bit at westward expansion, and you're going to see America had made a series of disadvantageous treaties with the uh, Native Americans and eventually would break many of those treaties. But uh, during this time, we're really going to focus on China forcing a series, being forced into a series where, for example, Hong Kong is given over to the British in the Treaty of Nanjing, and ports, many of them, are open to British traders. This was only uh, allowed at Guangzhou before, but now British basically can show up anywhere and receive the ability to trade not just opium, but anything they want. They're also given, again, extraterritorial status to British subjects, not subject to local laws, taxes, or any other restrictions of British uh, nationals while in China or Hong Kong. And later, other countries are able to get similar treaties out of China through this process. So let's look at East Asia in the 19th century. We have the little map on the left. We're going to look at that in a little bit. But we're focused right here on the right. Look at colonial possessions and spheres of influence. If you look at the brown near the top where it says Russian Empire, that is what the Russians basically owned. But if you look at the spheres of influence, which is the lighter brown, you're able to see the influence that that region uh, had exerted on it by the larger empire nearby. So while Russia might not have owned explicitly the large northern part of Manchuria, what you really see is that the Russian Empire effectively controls a lot of what happens there, a lot of the trade, a lot of the commerce, and pretty much some of the activities happening in that area. And this goes for Britain, Japan, France, and Germany. Uh, and if you look really closely, you'll see lots of little red dots. Those are treaty ports with Chinese and British and French and many other European uh, railways running through uh, large parts of China. 
Next, we get to the Taiping Rebellion. Large-scale rebellions in later 19th century reflect poverty and discontent of the Chinese peasantry. There are three, pretty much. There's, a, there's the Nian Rebellion, the Muslim Revolts. Uh, there's a few others that we're going to really focus on, specifically the Taiping Rebellion. Basically, people are hungry, people are poor, and this really comes about because population rises about 50% 50, 50 between 1800 and 1900. On my little... Uh, chart here on the right you'll see uh around f you know you see 1500 if you count 16 17 18 19 2000 count over two and look at where it's at around the ching by 1811 there's uh 357 million and within 40 years there's 430 million that is a huge jump with only in the span of 40 years and over that 100 years that we're talking about there is an even bigger jump right uh, the Nian Rebellion, the Muslim Rebellion, the Tuguan Rebellion, this is all frustration over poverty and policies of the government that aren't able to really address the population. We'll come back to that a little later. The Taiping Rebellion is led by Hong Zhiquan, a school teacher who calls for the destruction of the Qing Dynasty. Now, if you look at somebody who is sitting around saying that they are an educated person and what they have done is studied history and studied the world, what they want to know is... Uh, why do we need a king or an emperor? Why is this old, outdated idea of the mandate of heaven still something that we believe in? If we look at France and we look at America and we look at the rest of the Western Europeans, they aren't really big on this whole uh, God chose our guy in charge. So there is a rebellion that starts during this process. The Taiping platform, it's really, really uh, interesting slash strange. We've been talking for a while about the pendulum that is China. That's why I have those little uh, hanging back and forth marbles. Uh, one of the things that's happening at this very moment through Taiping is a move towards the more liberal attitudes in China. Before, China was very conservative. It had established a Qing uh, dynasty that had held really strong centralized government control over the people. But now the Taiping are uh, almost socialist, so, sort of proto-communist, which we'll get to a little later. And here's some of their uh, beliefs. They believe in the abolition of private property. No one should own land. The peasants should collectively own the land and collectively farm it and collectively share the resources. Very, very, very communist idea. There's a creation of communal wealth. Everyone shares everything in common. Very, very communist. There is prohibition of foot binding and concubines. More progressive attitude towards women and their equality, a very enlightenment idea and very socialized idea. Free public education and simplification of written Chinese and mass literacy. Through this process, the belief that everyone should be educated, everyone should have the ability to go to school, everyone should get free education is a very socialist idea. Uh, there is one weird caveat, though. <laughs> there was the prohibition of sexual relations among the followers of the Taiping, including married couples. So even if you were married, uh, there is no uh, sex between you and your wife or you and your husband. Yet, the leaders maintained harems of basically prostitutes and concubines. Very, very strange group of people. But you can see the direction they were heading, at least with that proto-communist socialist platform. Now, the Taiping are defeated. Uh, Nanjing gets captured in 1858 and made into the capital. And then they go on an attack uh, in Beijing with a force of one million, but are turned back. The imperial army is unable to contain the Taiping, so regional armies created with Manchu soldiers and outfitted with European weaponry. Again, the Europeans being able to physically outgun those people in China uh, through their use of technology and industrializations. Uh, Hong commits suicide, their leader, in 1864 and Nanjing is recaptured and a hundred thousand Taipings are massacred. Well, as a result, a little while after, we have this really weird moment in Chinese history. Some people are sitting around saying, hmm, we've looked at kind of history and we're kind of going, we like China, but we really like these new ideas. So how can we find maybe a syncretism in the beliefs, not necessarily religious ones, but more uh, political? So there's a high point in the 1860s and 1870s, and here's their slogan, Chinese learning at the base, Western learning for use. The belief of the self-strengthening movement was that China was awesome. China is amazing. China has a long and valuable history throughout the world of being the forerunners, the creators of gunpowder and, philo and other philosophies like Confucianism. And while that might be positive and awesome to start with, 
we need to adapt Western learning and education styles and secularization and the ideals of the Enlightenment to use and apply to, for example, our government. So there's a blend of Chinese cultural traditions with European industrial technology. For example, they're willing to accept shipyards to build large boats, railroads, uh, academies for learning. Uh, this change to the Chinese economy is superficial, really, uh, until the Empress Dowager Zhi diverts funds for her own aesthetic purposes. Uh, we'll come back to her a little later. Spheres of influence. The Qing Dynasty loses influence in Southwest Asia, along tributary states to uh, losing tributary states to Europeans and Japanese. For example, Vietnam falls to France in 1886. Burma falls to Great Britain in 1885. Korea, Taiwan, uh, Laodong Peninsula to Japan in 1895, and China itself is divided into spheres of influence, as I pointed out on that map before by 1895. So if we go back to the map on the far on the right again, we're looking at the you know, colonial possessions, the spheres of influence, and basically, uh, China's broken apart. The once strong centralized government of China is now uh, not really working out anymore. In 1898, there's a hundred days of reforms. Uh, Kang Yue in uh, Liang Kui Chao uh, basically sit down and say, hmm, a self-strengthening movement was cool, but let's let's do a little more. We're going to reinterpret Confucianism to allow for radical changes to our system. Remember, Confucianism is all about keeping things the way they are because the way things are are the way things ought to be, and radical change or quick change is not something that's valuable to a system, especially in the Confucius model. They are really pro-industrialization. Uh, the emperor, Wang Zhu, attempts to implement these reforms. However, again, that Empress Dowager Zhi, she nullifies the reforms and imprisons the emperor in uh, the Forbidden City. As you look at the attempt that was happening here, we again have those hanging uh, pendulum swinging. We have people trying to figure out a way to make China balance. They want uh, change for China to be strong and powerful, but they also don't want to lose their cultural identity or their national identity through this process and basically be uh, taken over by West Western Europeans. Well, then we get to the Boxer Rebellion. These guys are very interesting. She uh, supports a society of righteous and harmonious fists, uh, also known as the Boxers by the Western Europeans. They are anti-foreign militia units. She supports them because she sees that these uh, problems that China is dealing with basically stem from European spheres of influence and European uh, meddling in China. By 1899, there's a fight to rid China of the, quote, foreign devils. They're misled to believe European weapons would not harm them, which we'll come back to in a little bit. 140,000 boxers besiege European embassies in 1900. They are crushed by the European forces. If there is one thing that you know about Europeans is that Europeans don't like each other. But what they really don't like more is other people ganging up on them. And they're willing to work together to really fight off uh, any threat to their hegemony, especially in a region. China is forced to accept the stationing of foreign troops. What that means is, at this point, China is effectively uh, allowing large-scale military bases from many European nations to occupy parts of China with no end date in sight. Uh, the boxers, here are some pictures. This is one of my favorite pictures of all time. Uh, there is photographs showing the trial and execution of boxers. Yes, on the left-hand side, that's the trial. And on the right is a man with a giant sword and a bunch of heads of boxers below him. Very depressing is probably the best word. <laughs> there is the death of the Dowager Empress. Emperor dies a mysterious and sudden death while, oh, while in exile and arrested. And somehow Xi dies about one year late, one day later in November 1908. The two-year-old Pui is placed on the throne, and there's a revolution in 1911, and Pui gives up the throne in 1912. Now we're going to move on to Japan again. Issues in the country, Western, Western outcome impacts. Okay. Transformation of Japan. The Japanese society is in turmoil in the early 19th century. There's poor agricultural output. There are famines, high taxes. This sounds like a, a broken record at this point. The daimyo and the samurai classes decline, and the peasants start to starve. 
The Tokugawa government then attempts reforms, 1841 to 1843. First, they cancel the daimyo and samurai debts. The problem with uh, the system under the Tokugawa shogunate was that the daimyo and samurai basically were were effectively lords who paid tribute to the emperor, and uh, they basically didn't have any way of making goods or, or making money outside of protecting peasants, and then the peasants would then pay their uh, protection fees in the form of taxes to the lords. The lords would then eat the food and then give the rest to uh, tr- as tribute to the Tokugawa government. But eventually, through the process of famines and poor agricultural output, the daimyo and samurai go into massive amounts of debts. In an effort to stave off a uh, large-scale revolt, the Tokugawa government is allowing the daimyo and the samurai to not have to pay their debt. They also established merchant guilds, which caused an artificially high amount of prices for goods. Remember, uh, agreed upon by those guilds are the goods that are produced. They compelled peasants to return to cultivating rice, and overall, these reforms did not stop what was about to happen next. Enter Europeans and Americans attempting to establish relations. The U.S. in particular were looking for Pacific ports for whalers and merchants. Uh, whalers, for example, um, there's uh, this like material that whales have inside of them that's a very mm, specialized part to really expensive perfume that uh, was used for uh, centuries as part of perfume and Americans wanted that. And also uh, whale oil for a very long time was used as oil for lanterns. So they were looking for basically res- natural resources. Uh, Japan only allowed the Dutch presence in Nagasaki, if you remember way, way back. We love talking about the Dutch, and especially with trade, because the Dutch are those people who are willing to basically skip the religion, skip the proselytizing, skip the whole cultural exchange thing. They just wanted to make money. And at this point, the Japan only allowed those Dutch to be in Nagasaki trading what they approved of. By 1853, an admiral by the name um, Matthew Perry from the U.S. sails a gunship up to Edo, which is basically Tokyo today, and forces the Japanese to open port. He gives them an ultimatum. Open the port, trade with us, or I'll blow your whole city away with all the cannons and the uh, massive guns I have on the side of my boat. The Japanese don't really have the ability to fight them off. Again, Japan had closed itself off. They didn't really see the value of uh, large-scale trading. This sparks conservative Japanese reaction against the Shogun and rally around the Emperor in Kyoto. Again, um... The shogun was really effectively running the government, with the emperor being kind of a figurehead, and that all those tray, all those tributes, and all the taxes that went up to the emperor really kind of got funneled down to the shogun, and and the shogun was running the government in a, in a sense. Well, if you're a person watching this and you see that the, the samurai are pretty much ineffective and in debt, you see the shogun kind of living it up and you see an emperor that's far away and maybe uh would care but you know he doesn't know about it and this guy from america shows up with all his guns and is willing to destroy your whole country you kind of get very prideful of japan and you might say hey we need to rally around what makes us japanese and who we are and we're gonna we're gonna go to that emperor in kyoto and say hey uh we need to kind of get together and really support the emperor to fight back this foreign pressure Well, then this leads to 1868 with the Meiji Restoration. There's a small civil war between the Imperial and Tokugawa forces. Uh, By 1868, the Emperor Mushuto, uh, or Meiji, uh, 1852, in 1912, takes power. He reestablishes imperial order from small regional kingdoms and from the Tokugawa shogunate. The goals of prosperity and strength. He wants a rich country and a strong army. Now, with those goals in mind, he looks around the world and says, we are going to learn Western technology. Travelers Fukuzawa, Yukichi, and Ito Hirobumi travel to the U.S. and Europe on behalf of the emperor. They argue when they come back for the adoption of Western uh, legal proceedings and technology specifically. The Meiji government removes privileges from the daimyo and samurai, basically taking this once uh, noble uh, group uh, with land and uh, like a lord-vassal relationship and makes them just uh, as basic as anyone else. They conscript they conscript an army that replaces those samurai mercenary. In the past, if Japan was in need of defense, the samurais would work as basic mercenaries and fight it out. But this conscript army now is put in place to uh, really uh, 
uh, eliminate the need for those samurai. And eventually the samurai see that they've lost their land, they lost their titles, they've lost their privileges, they've lost their ability to tax their peasants, and they see an army replacing their income, and there is a uh, samurai rebellion, and it gets crushed by that national army now armed with western guns tax reform now has to switch over as well to the european western european model of cash or money not kind not goods it cannot be traded in rice or wheat so this tax reform uh basically eliminates the samurai in 1889 a constitution is set up it is very conservative meaning only five percent of the male population is allowed to vote in the 1890 election economic reforms to promote rapid industrialization just like western europe dramatic improvement in literacy rates uh literacy literacy rates as a result of uh education and government holdings are basically sold to private investors in the much the model of a market system that western european is focused uh western europe is focused on and these are known as zaibatsu uh, financial cliques. They're basically small groups of people with lots of concentrated wealth. We've made it. So I wanted to look a little bit back at these big ideas. Now that we've talked about this, I wanted to focus in on some of the things we talked about before. Their interactions with the West. These four groups that we've talked about really, uh, some fared poorly, some fared a little less. So, but, uh, as you can see, the West has kind of kicked in the doors of those four regions and really is starting to dictate terms. And those those other regions of the globe, uh, the Ottoman Empire, Russia, China, and Japan, really have to contend with those Europeans. The cultural and economic hege hegemony is very um, prominent throughout this region and this time. Uh, Europeans are not uh, very happy to just let countries and regions be. They are basically showing up trying to get what they can while they can. And the long-term effects of the Enlightenment really start to pop their heads up here as many of those groups uh, had been late to the party, to the ideas of secularization and democracy and republic and uh, are now adopting a lot of those uh, reforms in an effort to try and model themselves after Western Europe. Uh, the Ottoman reactions to modernization and European influence, very poor, basically uh, results uh, right at the end of World War One in the disillusionment of... Uh, the Ottoman Empire. The Russian expansion and Western facing of Russia pretty much uh, leads it to, during World War I, having many, many economic problems that lead to them joining World War I and having uh, huge problems with poor execution. The Chinese are unable to really get on the same page as a group and are kind of carved up by Europeans. And finally, the Japanese effectively just adopt whatever the Americans uh, dictate to them and adopt even American and Western style of uh, government and systems. In all four sections, again, the, the groups pretty much said, what do we do about these Europeans, their ideas, and their influence, and, and kind of run into some different ways of addressing it. Now, when you finish uh, studying this chapter, you should be able to do the following. Identify and discuss features of Ottoman decline and subsequent reform programs. Compare and contrast the reform movements within the Ottoman Empire, culminating with the Young Turk era. Identify the links between military defeat and reform efforts in the Russian Empire. Explain the development and consequences of the industrialization of Russia. Explain the links between Russian industrialization, repression, and the rise of revolutionary movements. Explain the significance of the Opium War and unequal treaties for Imperial China. Compare the origins, course, and impact of Chinese rebellions and reform movements. Understand and identify key features of Japanese political transformation in the late 19th century. And finally, identify and discuss the Meiji reforms. Here's your writing assignment, five days, short sentences on the following questions, blah, 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 blah. Before 1800, both China and Japan had limited contact with the outside world. The leaders of both nations considered theirs to be a superior culture and did not seek or welcome change. Discuss the changes in the Chinese and Japanese attitudes towards the Western ideas and Western technology over the course of the 19th century. That's number one. Number two, both Russia and Japan undertook ambitious pro programs of modernization and industrialization in the late 19th century. Compare the results and account for the differences. Number three, why were the states considered in this chapter so reluctant to grant political freedoms? Is it possible to reform a society without granting basic freedoms such as free speech, free press, freedom of religion, and the right to vote? Before answering no, consider the experience of Japan. As always, it's been fun talking to you. I hope you learned a lot. It's now time to get back in your book, reread. Uh, I'll talk to you guys a little bit later. Okay, bye. What we do here is go back, 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 back.
Code. 